Romania and Hugh. Devices. <laughs> I've always got a force, it's just a force of having the same appliances. <laughs> microwave. John chapter 8. So John chapter 8. So last week we spoke about out of Hebrews chapter 11 about how God's not ashamed of us. For those that were here last week, do you remember that? So I want to follow that on a little bit. So last week we found out that there's many people in the Bible that are regarded as, as faithful people. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, if you read it, it says by faith, X, Y, and Z. And in there it spoke about, I think it was around the 14th verse, 15th verse, something like that. It spoke about that God's not ashamed to be called their God. So that got me thinking a little bit. So the story in John chapter 8 is a story about the woman caught in adultery. Does everybody know that story? So if I paraphrase a little bit, no one's going to tell me off for not being correct biblically. I, I don't think, I, I don't see the need to read the whole lot out. But basically this woman is caught in adultery. Jesus goes into the temple early in the morning. Basically they bring her in the centre of the court. And they try to trap him by saying to him, by the law of Moses. Right? So by the law, she's been caught in adultery, she should be stoned to death. Everybody familiar with that? So how many of you know that the adultery is just a reflection of the sin? Yeah? Okay. So what that means is, if we look around the room, not everybody in the room is committed adultery. Cool? Anybody committed a murder in here? Probably didn't want to put your hand up for that one anyway. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, is I want to focus on the sinful thing, not the adultery. Have you got that? So in your own lives, I'm pretty sure you can all equate to something that you've done wrong. Yeah, everybody's done something wrong. Anybody done anything wrong? Or was it just on an orphan out the front? Of you? <laughs> when I was looking at this, I started, um, and God set me free, so it's not like I've gone on a condemnation cruise down my life, but I started thinking back, because when he said that he's not a... You know, he's not ashamed of me. He started making me think a little bit of what I've, what I've done and what he's set me free from and what he doesn't hold me accountable for anymore. So then he took me into this story. The part of the story I thought he was going to focus on was the, the, the part of the story where she was taken into the centre of the court. It's like, you ever notice that when you fall short in front of God, like if you do a sinful thing, you notice it becomes centre to your life? Anybody ever notice that? It takes centre stage in your life. So what do you reckon for this woman? She's been caught in adultery. They've grabbed her. What I find interesting is that one the boat didn't get caught for adultery as well. <laughs> That's an interesting one, isn't it? But anyway, she gets caught. I reckon the chances are, do you reckon they caught her that morning or they might have caught her the day before? What do you reckon the chances are? She might have been locked up for the night or something. How many people get locked up when you break the law if you do something wrong? Anybody else been locked up in the room? I've visited a few prisons, so I'm wrong. <laughs> a few cells. Anyway, so I thought that that's what he would have talked about, and he said to me, I want you to go a bit further. So I thought, okay, so you want me to talk about how they were judging her and how they were holding her to account, how they were trying to trap Jesus into saying something contrary to what the law said. And the Lord said to me, I want you to go a bit further. And I thought, but I know this story. How many people know this story, yeah? All right, so most Christians will know this story. It's a pretty popular story. It's pretty famous. Anyway, so I kept going to the next part of the story, and I said, so this is what you want me to focus on? He said, no, I'm going to keep going. So if we can put the first scripture up, please, and this. I've only got a couple of scriptures, but I want you to think about this flowing, okay? So this is where he tells me to start from. However, when they persisted with their question, he raised himself up and said, let him, him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And I thought, that's what we're focusing on, throwing stones at everybody. And he said to me, no, I want you to start there, but I want you to go further. And I'm thinking, we're just about at the end of this story and you want me to go further. So I started looking at this and I started thinking something. How many of you throw stones at yourself when you sin? Mm. God just put a whole different twist on this with me when he said, I want you to look deeper into the story. Most of us know what sin looks like, yeah? Most of us know when somebody does something wrong, what do we tend to do? We tend to sin in judgment, don't we? I can't help myself, I've got myself in trouble in my own mind with God, so I'm giving you that nobody knows. But I read this thing on Facebook that some vegans were cracking the wobbles over Bunnings cooking sausages to raise money for the fires. And the vegans were having a silk session over it. And I went, really? Like, really? 
Then I realize something. What am I doing? Judging them because it's not an opinion that I have. How many of us in the room actually think we judge more than we realize? I think every hand should go up. So this started to show me something, and this is not the message. This is only the start of it. We're going to keep moving to get to the message. But then I realized something, and I started looking at how many actually throw stones at themselves. How many think you're unworthy when you fall off and do something wrong? Now, don't worry about the sin that people don't see. I'm talking about the stuff you do that nobody sees. And we've all got that, haven't we? Or am I an orphan in the room? This is where I just won't look at my body. So I don't think I'm looking at you. This actually spoke to me. It was God talking to me. And he said to me, while you're throwing stones at yourself, how well do you think you're going about it? How well do you think you're doing while you're throwing stones at yourself? Is it getting any easier? Are you find it any easier to break through? While you're throwing stones at yourself, you don't really need somebody else to throw stones, do you? Okay, so... Let's go to the next verse, please. And he bent down and went on writing on the ground with his finger. You know, one of the things that took me by surprise was while they were talking and while they were doing things, if you notice, he totally disengaged his eyesight with them and he looked at the ground. How many of us can disengage our sin and look at the ground? Actually, Instead of sitting there throwing stones at each other, or at ourselves, sorry, instead of throwing stones at ourselves, how many can actually stop throwing stones and look away from what's going on and look at the ground? Take our eyes off of what we've done wrong. Is that easy or hard? Oh, it is ridiculously hard. I actually tried it. I did. I thought, I'm going to try this. How long do you think before my head came straight back up again thinking about it? Jesus did something amazing just in this, in this little bit of scripture. He, he stopped looking, which meant he wasn't listening because he wasn't paying attention, and he looked down. And he started writing on the ground. Now, I don't know what he wrote. I'm not a good people scholar. Maybe some of us should look up. I don't know. Maybe we should instead of looking. So I actually tried this. I had an opinion come into my heart, a judgment come into my heart, while I was thinking about this message, about a testimony I'm going to give you shortly. And when I was thinking about the testimony, I'm reflecting on a 20-year-old testimony. This is not a current testimony, right? And I started thinking, what an idiot. What a, what a crazy person. And then I realized what I was doing again, still looking. And then I started saying, thank God, I'm not like that. And then I went, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> And the Lord said to me, so if we start having a check with you, Red, let's have a look at you. And I went, oh, I think we should talk about something else, Lord. Anybody else don't want to talk to me about yourself? Um, that's everybody, I think. Because when he comes along and he says he wants to deal with something in your life, how hard is that? When he says, I want to focus on this point with you. I'd rather talk about somebody else because then it doesn't matter. Don't talk about me, Lord. So I found myself, I started throwing stones again at myself. So in the blink of an eye, I started going, oh, you keep on doing the same thing. When are you ever going to stop doing this, Red? Anybody else have these debates inside your own head? Okay. Just want to get that clear that I'm not the only one with problems. <laughs> All right. So this is not what I want to talk about, actually. This is just leading up into it. So can we go to the next verse, please? I think... They listened to him and then they began going out, conscience stricken, one by one, from the oldest down to the last one of them, till Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there before him in the centre of the court. What did Jesus do for you when he came into your life, when you invited him in? We heard Carrie this morning talking about he refreshes and renews the soul. We heard Darren talking about Paul with that supernatural grace that can get you through. A supernatural strength that can get you through your persecutions. So what did he do for you? So now I'm actually asking you. What did he do for you when you invited him into your life? What did he do? And only you can answer this, by the way. You can't answer this for nobody else. And you can't try and polarise it or compare it or similar. Because we're all individuals, yeah? So all of us come to him in a different way. How many of you came in happy as clappy? Hey, this is beautiful. I want you. How many came in that way? Okay. How many came in that way, born in the church, never did anything wrong and just know anymore your life? Don't put your hands up. And how many of you came in busted and wounded and broken and an absolute mess? <laughs> I said don't put your hands up. 
I came in a sinner. Okay, so this is how I came in. I didn't come in through the church. I didn't come in through all the hairy fairy stuff. I didn't come in through revelation. I came in through forgiveness. So the one thing that I hold on to all of my life and I will continue to hold on to is the forgiveness of my sin. Okay? But he said, I've forgiven you. Now, there's a few problems I have in that, and that is, I'm the first problem, because I've got to try and remember that when I fall over. I've got to remember that he said, I forgave you of your sin previous, current, and to come. How many of you actually understand what that means? It means when you fall over and you say, Lord, forgive me, he says, done. Well, how is that to receive? Oh, not that easy if you're of my head. So I go back all the time. So I don't go back to... And I just heard a story which has broken my heart and I'm not going to give too much detail, but I just heard a story of a person who wasn't baptised and they were refused burial because they weren't baptised by a priest. Can you get your head around that? Not baptised, therefore can't be buried by a priest. I don't know how that sounds to you, but I've got to watch the judgment that rises up inside of me because my Bible teaches me, remember, I came into forgiveness. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Doesn't matter what church you sit in. Doesn't matter what you cultural beliefs you've got. What does it say? All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I've got to watch myself a little bit because I can quite easily get into very um, opinionated positions. <coughs> So I've got to remember that he forgave me. So you remember I said before, go and say that God has forgiven you? Yeah, you are forgiven. How many of you know that you have the power, because of Christ in you, to forgive sins? Remember Christ. Somebody hurts you or wounds you and you say, forgive them, Lord, what have you actually done? Release them. What's the opposite to yourself if you can't remember that? What do you do to yourself? What do you do? Condemn? Judge? You know, when you can't actually stand in front of yourself and say, but Lord, you've forgiven me, please forgive me. How many feel that forgiveness come in the click of a finger and get through it straight away and never have to deal with it again? I wish that would happen for me. Oh, I said to me this ongoing process of constantly having to do it. Anybody else relate to that? So how you see yourself and how you see Jesus is going to depend a lot upon the next scripture we get to, because that's where we're going to go. And I'm going to touch on a really sensitive topic this week. Let's go. When Jesus raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? So I'm going to ask you a question. Where are your accusers? Do you have any? You have any of the one that you go? Remind you? Point the finger at you? And before you comment, I'm going to say I'm bad for this. I've still got some healing. I've got some stuff I've got to work through. I'm still opinionated, judgmental, argumentative. Right. And that's just a start. <laughs> if you want to go deeper, there's more. And God's saying to me, I want to set you free from this. Because what it's doing is getting in the way. So we're going to talk about a topic that I think is going to be an interesting one. So I just want to, this is, and then, so I said to the Lord, I said, so this is what we're talking about. He said, no, that's not what we're talking about. That's just the precursor of what we're talking about. We're going to talk about the last sentence. So we had to read all of that to get to one sentence. Can we go to that, please, at the back? She answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go on your way and from now on sin no more. Does anybody know what it means by sin no more? That's what we're focusing on today. Anybody know what it means by sin no more? So I'm going to give you a second to think about it. I've spent a couple of hours, I've spent a week, I've talked to people, I've talked to myself, I've talked to God, I've even argued with myself what this sin no more means. You ever bothered to ask God what it means for you? So let's have a look on the surface, shall we? So on the surface, sin no more when he said to her, so she's an adulterer, okay? She's been busted. She's standing there. They're about to kill her. May I ask you a question? 
And if you don't check the scriptures, can somebody find out for me what happened to her after this moment? I can't find it. So I'm not a biblical scholar, so I'm not going to... Did she keep on adultery? Did she? Did she walk away? Did she stop? Did she go about her life and never do it again? Mm, interesting point, yeah? So the sin no more point. So I started thinking about grace and I started thinking about law. So we're going to talk about law first. Do you know there's plenty of places, and I've just told you one of a particular denomination that said if you're not baptized by us, you cannot be buried by us. That's a bit condemning, isn't it? <coughs> Yet for me, I think if you believe in Jesus, that should qualify you, shouldn't it? So, sin no more. So what does law say? So let's have a look at some things. So you do drugs, you do alcohol, you're an adulterer. What would the law say to you? The law of God. What would it say? Cut it out. Stop or else you're not forgiven. I've heard this preached many times under a law point of view. But if you do this, God's forgiveness can't be there for you because you haven't changed. So there's an expectation in Christian circles that if you've got an alcoholic problem or you've got a drug problem, sexual problem, greed problem, I don't know, whatever problem you can think of, go and sit no more, stop it or else. How many of you actually think that that can happen to everybody every time? I don't think so. It didn't happen for me. You know, when I got forgiven of my drug addiction, it didn't happen in the first five seconds. Anybody else still struggle to let go of some things? So then you got the grace point of view, and this is the one that I hear a lot of too. Well, you've been forgiven of your sin. You don't sin no more. You've received Jesus Christ in your life, you can never sin again. Can I tell you, that means that I can go rape whoever I want? Does that mean I can go murder whoever I want because I'm forgiven? It just doesn't make sense, does it? So I think that you've got a law point of view that points the finger at you and says, get your life right or else. And then there's a grace point of view, this priest that says, well, now you're free to do what you want. If we're free to do what, I, what, what we want, how do you reckon it was going for this woman caught in adultery? How do you reckon she was feeling right at this moment when they've grabbed her, they've put her in the centre, they're standing around with stones and they're like, you're about to die. When Jesus comes along and he says to her, yeah, there's no one here to condemn you, go and sit no more, do you reckon she was grateful? Or, whew, I don't know that one. What attitude do you reckon she had? One of gratitude, my sin's been forgiven, oh man, I should be dead right now, praise God. Or, whew, how many of us, when we get away, we're doing something and go, whew, got away with that? Well, I'm only going to talk for myself. I know what I'm like. I'm not going to lie in front of you because I'm going to tell you the truth because I know who's listening to me. If I get up here and say, no, 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 that's not me, and he's up at heaven going, really, really? You know, I know everything. You know, I get away with certain things every now and then. I'll do the finger in the roundabout and nobody sees me. Ooh, why am I still doing it? Why am I still doing it? Well, I'm asking myself this question now. Why am I still judging other Christians for their thoughts? Well, now I'm starting to answer myself. Am I living under grace or am I living under law? Which one am I living under? Have I received that fullness of the forgiveness of that sin to move away from it? So I went and had a look in, at a few commentaries. I went and had a look at the dictionary. I went and had a look. Go and sin no more means to do what? Turn. Turn. So if you're going down this road and then you suddenly get into a place where you say, this is hurting me, and how many people have come into the kingdom through pain of one form or another? Most people? So I can speak about the majority of us, yeah? Certainly myself. When God turned up in my life, I had a drug addiction that I could... I, I can remember sitting on a tractor, right, that I had driven. It was an international 484 with forks. <laughs> that I had driven for 12 years, 10, 12 years, and I remember being that off me guts one day that I couldn't remember how to start the track. And I sat there for half an hour trying to remember how to start the track. Do you reckon I was having a good life at that point? So when God came along and he said to me, I'm going to heal you of that, and he did, by the way, in a second, he set my mind free of all of that, where my mind was clear and everything. Do you reckon the drug addiction dropped off in a second? Holy dooly. So I started looking at this. This is where we get in trouble. 
Because when God comes along and he says your sin's forgiven, go and sin no more, we think that that means external. So I started taking this up with God and I said, Lord, so what's my problem, Lord? Anybody else ask you what their problem is? What, what's going on with me? Does anybody else do that? Angel Will Robinson, what do you do? It's the moment you say to him, examine my heart, oh Lord, what do you think he does? He examines. So I started talking to him about me and about this go sin no more. I understand what happens. What do you think would happen to this adulteress if she had gone back to adultery? Remember, she's known now. She's exposed. It's out in the open. What do you reckon would have happened to her? I reckon she would have got caught again. Except next time, she probably would have got stoned to death. Because I wonder who else would have advocated on her behalf. I want to tell you a story that's 20 years old, right? 20 year old story. I knew this lady, not personally, but I knew of her. She had hepatitis C from sharing needles, and she had full blown hepatitis C. You all know hepatitis C can kill you, yeah? yeah. So she had full blown hepatitis C and she went to church. Now let me tell you what happened to her. When she got diagnosed with a full blown hepatitis C, how many of you think of her friends want to share needles with her? None. None of them because what were they afraid of? Catching the hepatitis C. So they're all sharing needles, they're all druggies. She gets hepatitis C, suddenly a whole world turns upside down. Her friends don't want to share needles with her. How many of these men do you reckon were lining up to say, can I sleep with your lady while she's out in front of me to get stoned to death? I reckon all of them would have departed. How many men do you reckon would have got up and said, I've been with her? None. Right? So this woman goes to a church. This is a true story. She goes to a church, and she only goes to church for a little while, a couple of months, I think, not long from what I can remember, and she gets totally healed with hepatitis C. And when I say totally healed, she goes to the doctors, and it is completely gone medically. What do you think of that woman right there? Do you think she would have been grateful yet? Nobody wanted to know her. She had no friends because she now had a plague disease. You know what I mean? So what do you reckon this woman did? Do you reckon she went, oh, Lord, you've changed me. You've healed me of hepatitis C. Well, that's what I would have liked to have thought in a happy ending story. Do you know what she actually did? She went straight back to share a needle or something. Yeah, this is a true story. It was a lady in Maroc. She went back to share her needles and within two years she was dead. Because now the hepatitis C came back and not only did it go nasty, it went with a vengeance. See, she got healed by God, so the whole turn and sin no more, what do you reckon went wrong? Surely she would have had enough brains in her head to understand that if I put a needle back in and I'm sharing, our chances are I could get in trouble again. Well, that would make common sense, wouldn't it? So on the surface, I know another person who I ministered to, was told they didn't have long to live. I'll do anything, Red. And Pastor Cheryl knows this story well. She was there. This person gets touched by God. Comes to church for a little while because I've been told I'm going to die. I've only got a few months to live. She gets prayed for. She gets healed, walks out of hospital the next day. Where do you think she's doing today? Do you reckon she took that go and sin no more point of view? and walked away and grateful to have her life back, or do you reckon she's exactly back where she was before? Can I tell you, she's exactly back where she was before. Drinking, drugs, doesn't need God now. Oh, here's where the fun starts. You know, if you read the story in John chapter 5, and I did, but this is not part of this, I'm just going to chuck it in because it spoke to me. Jesus heals this particular person. And then he sees this particular person, he says, now go sin no more, or else it'll be worse for you than it was the first time around. Go read John chapter 5. This is Jesus' words where he says, go, turn from your sin, or else something worse will come upon you. So that got me thinking a little bit. How do you turn from your sin? Any of you got any ideas? Anybody got any practice at it? Anybody been able to pull it off? Sorry? Repentance is the first one. First, you've got to acknowledge you've got a problem. You ain't done nothing wrong if you ain't got a problem. I'm all right, I got nothing to control. God just come along and fix me right now, but I just want to still be able to keep going and doing this stuff. That's genie in the bottle, Christianity. And I know so many people do it, and I'm going to be the first to say that I treat him like a genie in a bottle. Come and fix me, Lord. Now you fix me. Okay, I'm all right again now. And back into the old ways. So I started looking at this law and this grace thing on how do we 
turned from our sin. And I started to look at this a bit deeper and I started to look at myself. And I reckon if you look at yourself, maybe there's a key here for you today. Maybe there's not. But I started thinking if it was that easy for these two examples I've given you, what is it that was wrong with them that brought them back to the sin? You know how you see people struggling? You see people, they'll get prayed for, they ask for forgiveness, they give their life to Jesus and they're back in the same mess a week later, a month later. We've all seen it, haven't we? What do you reckon the problem is? I reckon the problem is they're throwing too many stones at themselves. That's what God's showing me. While you're sitting there throwing stones at yourself, I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm just a failure. What do you think you're actually doing? Jesus said in this story, and I pointed it out to you, he said, where are your accusers now? She said, none. Then neither do I accuse you. You don't have to have the world accusing you. Why don't we just stop accusing ourselves? You know how many people in the last three weeks inside of this church I've been hearing are struggling with worthiness issues? So let's try this again, shall we? Because there's only a few of us today. Don't put your hand up, but you'll know. Are you still struggling with self-worth in front of God? Answer it for yourself. Don't look at me. You're still struggling with those hidden thoughts, those hidden desires in your heart that you just can't get free from? Maybe ask God to examine where you're at with yourself. See, he says, I am not ashamed of you in your sin. Get your head around that if you can. He says, I sent my one and only son to die for you because that's how much I loved you. Come as you are, come broken. But I love you too much to leave you broken. So most of us have got to fix something spiritual before we can fix something physical. See, if it would be that easy, if you ask Dr. Coopers, because he's in the house, addictions are so easy to drop in two seconds, aren't they, Coopers? Without the Holy Spirit and without Jesus setting you free, what do you think the chances of getting free are? Oh, there's abstinence. I'm, oh, mate, there's plenty of people that abstain from things. There's a difference from abstinence and freedom. Abstinence is you're still trying to work it out. Freedom is you're outworking it. How many of you know you're redeemed, not reformed? How many of you know that the very person you were before Christ came in is still relevant if you let it be? You know, nothing's changed. How many of you learned how to ride a push bike when you were a kid? How many learned how to ride a push bike? How many of you still ride a push bike? Okay, oh, well, aren't, you, aren't you so healthy, please? <laughs> to the rest of you, do you think you could ride a bike? Might wobble a little bit to start? Yeah, you might be a little bit. But I reckon once you've learned how to do something, you know how to do it, don't you? If you know how to get yourself into sinful situations, you know exactly how to get yourself in, whether God's in your life or not. You know exactly what tempted you in the first place. You know exactly what brought you to that point, And you know exactly why you're there. Yeah, and then nobody else to tell you. I'm just being honest because man, God had this chat, all right? <laughs> now you're on the end of it. Because <laughs> he started talking to me. He said, you know why you're giving the finger at the roundabout. I'm going, no, I don't. He goes, yes, you do. He goes, no, I don't. They're just idiot drugs. My point proven, Red. <laughs> he said to me, before you're going to fix doing that, you have to fix why you do that. Here's the key. The lady that had the hepatitis C, right? When she was kicked out by her friends, she was rejected. She was condemned. She was not worthy now because they were, they were shooting needles up. Because I remember this, she was bawling her eyes out in church. They were shooting up until that day she came home and said, I've got hepatitis C. So you reckon all the friends wanted to keep shooting up? They dropped it in a second. True? So what actually happened to her? She was rejected, condemned, abandoned. These are all things that are of a broken spirit, yeah? So she came into the church, she got the physical healing. So as soon as she got told she was okay, where do you reckon she wanted to go back to? She wanted to go back to where she was because that's where she found her life. Jesus is trying to say, I want you to sin no more. But if she's got nobody to help her, so all she wants to do 
is be accepted by that crowd of people because that's where she hung out. How many people I know go back drinking with other people just to fit in? Drugs, women, money, just to try to fit in because there's a reason you got there in the first place. Oh, it gets interesting now, doesn't it? Oh, because now you're going to have people come and say, well, if you don't fix it, you're not good enough. Mate, I went and did a funeral on Monday to a dear friend of mine that I spent five years with, right? And I was talking to the family about it. I'm pretty comfortable with who I am. And he wanted me to do the funeral in footy shorts, right? And he's about number six now to send to him in footy shorts. I'm like, I can't do that. Anyway, the family got pretty angst and they said, this is about him, not the community. And I'm like, yeah, but I've still got an appearance to make, right? So I said, I'll just wear a suit. And they said, no, you're not wearing a suit. That'll be out of character, that won't be right, that's not what he wanted. So I compromised and I went there in jeans and a shirt, right? When I got there, these funeral directors, they thought they were the heads pants. And I'll leave it at that. What do you reckon they thought when they looked me up and down? Seriously? They looked me up and down and they stood there in judgment, right? And straight away, the first thing I went, there's an E and knuckleheads. <laughs> Well, tell me if I'm wrong to the rest of you. Somebody annoys you, somebody hurts you, what's the first thing that rises up? Come on, work that out for yourself, I'm just telling. And I heard the Lord say to me, have I not forgiven you? Does it matter? Let it go. Turn from your sin. Let it go. One of the hardest problems I have is to let it go. Because when somebody crosses me, oh, I want to do what with it. You know, when we talk about Paul, as Darren was sharing this morning, you know, he went before God and he said, take this from me. And God said in some in a version, I'm not sure what version Darren read from, but it said, my grace is sufficient for thee. What is grace? What is grace? How many of you have actual grace for yourselves? From God. Let yourself off the hook. Let yourself be worthy. So the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It's the goodness of God that is supposed to lead us away from what we do. Because the question I've got for you is how many of you came into the kingdom because what you were doing was so happy chappies and so pleasant you're having a ball? You came in because it was hurting. You came in because it wasn't life fulfilling. Yeah? So let me ask you something. If we go back to that, what do you think is going to happen? It will be the same, won't it? Seven times worse, maybe. Jesus said this in John chapter 5. He said, go and sin no more because something worse may come upon you. You know, when you come into the kingdom and you're still struggling with unworthiness and something goes wrong, and then how much harder is it to try and get out of that unworthiness when you're throwing stones at yourself? Anybody in here understand that? Anybody in here got that problem? You don't have to put your hand up because I know a few of you have. <laughs> Here's the deal. To go and sin no more means you're going to have to change why you're doing it. Oh yes, this lady very quickly, she dropped doing the needles. I think that was more out of force than out of choice. Because now nobody wanted to do needles with her. And she was told you're going to die. Right? She was told that. If God said to you today, this is your last day, do you think going and getting on the grog or getting on the drugs or going and chasing women around or going and chasing your bank account would still be as prominent? If God told you today you're coming home to be with me, what would you do? And by the way, as a pastor, I've listened to people talking to me after someone's died and they're going, oh, I wish I'd have had more time. And I'm going, what more time? You had plenty of time. You just didn't prioritise it. You didn't want the value of that person in your life. You were too busy doing your own thing and now they're gone. You can do what about it? I tell my wife every day I love her. Do you know why? Because there will be a day that I can't say it anymore. You know that, don't you? Husbands, tell your wife you love them because one day you won't be. Oh, Red, how dare you talk like that? Well, I'm sorry, but I actually can. My wife and my father died a, a year apart. I didn't get to be with my dad because I was with my wife. So I didn't get to spend that time with him and he died within three months of diagnosis. 
He was too busy doing something else. On his deathbed, he was in a coma. I told him he was in a coma. God spoke to me, so I got a word of knowledge for him. This is what came out of my mouth, and my dad came out of a coma. Can you believe that? He woke up. And the word of knowledge was simple. Son, behold your father. Father, behold your son. And I cried too much. I couldn't get the rest out. I went over to him. I kissed him on top of the head. Now, my dad was old school. You don't kiss men, right? <laughs> That's my dad. I'm not old school. And he used to always pull away like that. Hey. This day, I got to do one thing that he had not done with me all my life. He tilted his head towards me. Kissed him on top of the head and I told him I loved him. He went straight back into a coma and four hours later he died. By the grace of God. Take a look around the room. You all think we're going to be here in a hundred years? Take a look. I don't know. Look at your spouse next to you. If you've got a spouse here with you, you think you're still going to be with that person a hundred years? What do you think matters? Here's the deal. When Jesus said, go sin no more, what he was saying was turn, but you've got to turn more than just physically. You've got to be able to turn spiritually. It's him saying, I've forgiven you. If he's forgiven you, why are we still throwing stones at ourselves? Do you need somebody else to throw stones? How, how, how many of you at night time find yourself going down this little merry-go-round? I'm just talking about me and God. Because I thought when he first said to me, I want you to talk about go sit no more. I went, oh God, here we go. This is going to be a topic. Because I've heard the whole, I've heard churches dress properly or you're not accepted. Go do Bible school or you're not accepted. So I've broke every rule you can think of. I don't dress properly, I don't talk properly, I don't look properly, and I never went to Bible school. Does Jesus love me? Contrary to that? Pretty funny, don't you think, that for somebody who never did any of this, have a look what God's doing with me. Have a look at the favour and the access I'm getting, but then I come back and go, you're a failure, you're useless, Fred. When are you going to grow up? That comes out of my heart. Anybody else do that? comes out of my heart. And I've got God saying to me, really? Really? How many times do we have to go through this, Fred? And I go, what do you mean go through it? And he said, I don't condemn you. Why are you condemning yourself or letting somebody else condemn you when I no longer condemn you? Yeah, but Lord, you know I'm doing the finger. Yeah, I know, Red. Well, let's work through why you're doing it. Lord, you know I want to knock that person out. I want to kill that person. I'm strain to some people. It's not I know. I know. Let's work on it. But Lord, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel like I'm doing enough for the kingdom. I don't feel like I'm favoured enough. I feel like I'm a dropkick. I feel all of this stuff. And he's saying, I know. You think he doesn't know you? Turn to the person next to you and say, he knows you. Not for you. Turn to the person he next to you. He knows you. <laughs> he knows you. And yet he still says, I love you. He still says, I'm not ashamed of you. My goodness, it's still in my head in at the moment. He's, and I'm saying, okay, Lord, so I'm chucking all of this at you. I'm telling you all this stuff. And it's going, I know. It might take us a lifetime to work on this. And he's saying, that's why I don't want you to judge why some people seem to get set free quicker than others because you don't know the struggles within them. But I do. What was that, Lord? I worked with a dear friend, in fact, a couple of people this week that are, str are starting to understand how worthy they are, Emma, aren't they? And what's happening? Changing everything. Know how worthy you are, how precious you are. And this has got nothing to do with law and grace. This has everything to do with a saviour saying, I condemn you no more. <laughs> this has got everything. So when people start on the law, the grace topic, and they start talking about, you need to do this, can I just say this to you? If the first thing that you can understand in your heart is that he's not ashamed of you for the first thing, and if the first, second thing after that is that while you were yet still a sinner, he died for you. While you're still sinning, he died for you. Is that an excuse? I think Romans says somewhere in there. I was going to look the scriptures up, but I didn't. Romans 5. I was going to say 7 or 5, so there you go. See, you know the scriptures. I should hang out with you. <laughs> Romans 5 says, Therefore do not let grace be a reason to what? Do you know what grace actually is? 
Grace is the unmerited favour of God. So let me show you something when I believe there is no grace. I believe that that lady, when she got set free from hepatitis C, rather than being thankful and letting God deal with the reasons why she wasn't, she went straight back and she said, I'm healed now. I can do what I want. She went straight back to putting needles in her arm that had been in hepatitis C. So my question is, if she got set free from it, who has hepatitis C in the group that nobody knew about? Think about that. Because she got diagnosed, but who had the hepatitis C to give it back to her the second time? So if you think you can just go, oh, I'm okay now, I can go back to sleeping with whoever I want, drinking whatever I want, doing whatever drugs I want and I'm, I'm cool, can I tell you you're deceived? Because if it hurt the first time, what are you thinking the second time? If it's hurt you the first time, going back to it ain't going to be no different than what it was the first time. I'm starting to understand something, that when I want to beat people up, it didn't help the first time. Ten assault charges prove that. I'm going to lock you up, said a judge, if you come before me again, before I was 21. What do you think is going to happen if I go back to entertaining, knocking people out? And by the way, my wife said to me, I wouldn't be doing that well with you. Right? Oh, she loves me. And she went, no, your ambition outweighs your ability. <laughs> you get old, son. So what do you reckon if you're still living in unworthiness? Has it got any better? Since the first time when Jesus came? If you're going to keep condemning yourself, has it got any better than the first time? No. It will get worse. Because these things that are spiritual are like a cancer. They start in one area and they spread to others. You watch how far unforgiveness will spread in your life if you allow it. Watch what it does. Oh, it will spread everywhere. If you've got anger in your heart because of something you went through and Jesus says, I've forgiven you from that, you've asked for forgiveness, he says it's done, and you keep picking it up, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to spread. It's going to grab a hold on you. Jesus, when he said, go sin no more, he said, change from the direction you're going. So how do we do that? Let's change what we do. There's the number one obvious thing in that. If going out and hanging out with the boys down the pub, getting on the turf is getting assault charges, maybe you should stop going to the pub. That would help, wouldn't it? Do you know that was the first thing I had to do? Stop going to the pub, because every time I went to the pub and drunk, I wanted to beat somebody up. You see, people have that change when they're on alcohol, yeah? Start changing. So there's your physical. If you're getting yourself in trouble, ladies, with looking at men, don't go where there's men. Or vice versa. If you get yourself in trouble with money, start turning away from it. There's your physical. So how does that look spiritual? How does that look spiritual? Anybody got any ideas? You've got to start to change the way you think. If you've suffered with this unworthiness point of view, and you've landed yourself into relationship after relationship because every time you get in a relationship, you feel so bad, all you're doing is longing for love, all you want to do is not be alone, you're going to have to stand and face it. What do you reckon is going to happen when you stand and face it? It's going to hurt. It took pain to get you into it, facing that pain to get out of it. Now, you've all got to feel sorry for Annette. She waited 15 years. She thought she'd wait for a bloke from God. She waited 15 years and then she got the... <laughs> oh, Rick, she's prayed a few times since then. <laughs> she cracked a tantrum. She actually said to me, she went before God, she cracked a tantrum. This has been 15 years. What are you doing? I can't take it anymore. He said, okay, have him. And then she went, can we be strange? No. no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> no negotiation. <laughs> when I read this ghost in no more and I started looking at this adulteress, I thought, I wonder whether she was able to change the reasons why she was committing adultery. Because that's the real problem, isn't it? Not the actual act of sexual, of sexual misconduct, it's why she's doing it is the real problem, don't you think? Because you can take her out of that, but how long do you think she can abstain from it if she's still broken inside for what started it? Jesus said, I condemn you no more. The amount of people I'm seeing, including myself, that are still allowing themselves to throw stones. So imagine if we could actually stand up and, you know, when that unworthy thought comes, or I'm not good enough, I'm too fat, too skinny, too black, too white, too young, too old, whatever it is, and we actually go, no, nah, I don't agree with that anymore. 
Has anybody tried that? How hard is it when you start trying it, Emma? Oof, everything turns to mud. But if it took decades to get into it, it didn't take decades for God to put you out of it. But it took a little bit of hurt, didn't it? Just picking on Emma. You don't have to go through 20 years to take 20 years to get out of it. All you're going to have to do is let God take it from you. And the first thing that's got to change is how you see yourself. That's what God's showing me. That's what God's showing me. I used to do bodybuilding, right? Got right into it when I was a kid, punch of mine, blah, 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 still like big things. And then the Lord spoke to me. Because this has all been happening in the last week, all right? And I went, I oh, know, Lord, I'm just too lazy to do weights. <laughs> I just couldn't be bothered. And he said, no, I saw that out of vanity that you had in you. I'm like, what? Yeah, because you had a vanity issue inside of you that I had to deal with. What? Yeah, you wanted to be big so you could intimidate other people. That's vanity. Pride. No, why? I just thought I was too lazy. Oh, yeah. Because, see, I got bullied when I was a kid. So getting big was the idea of if I get bigger than everybody else, nobody will bully me. What do you think actually happened when I got bigger than most people? I became the bully. And they said to me something when I first became a pastor. She said to me, don't become the very thing you despise the most. Don't become it. If you don't like being judged, then don't judge. If you don't like being condemned, then don't condemn. Don't become the very thing you despise the most. Turn from your sin. That means you're going to have to change the way you see things. You know when Jesus said to a turn, everybody turn your head to the left. Right, turn to the left, don't look at me. How many of you can actually see me if you turn to the left? But you've got to look out the corner of your eye. Your focus is not on me, yeah? In the Bible, Jesus, you can straighten up again. In the Bible, Jesus said, when they slap you on the left, turn to the right. You know what he was referring to? I always thought, yeah, slap you that side, slap you that side. That's not what he showed me. He said, when they slap you, Red, if you keep looking, you're going to retaliate. But if you turn the other way, you can't see your refusal. Some of us actually have to turn away from what we're looking at. Some of us actually have to turn away from those accusations of unworthiness, those accusations of not being good enough. We're going to actually have to stand our ground and go, I ain't talking to you no more. Jesus, man, I tell you, I don't know about you guys, but this has really spoke to my heart. This has really spoke to me when he said to me, turn from your sin. I always seen that to get your life right or else. I'm seeing it in a whole different light. He ain't talking about grace. He ain't talking about law. He's talking about change direction in your mind and your heart, what you're looking at. Because if you don't, you're going to stay exactly where you are. How many of you want to stay where you are right now? Don't want to grow. Don't want to deepen in love. Don't want to find worthiness in your heart. Don't want to serve God. How many of you would love to stay right where you are right now? I don't know too many people that would because there's always something we want to change, yeah? Something we want to fix. It means if you keep walking in the same direction, talking in the same direction, looking in the same direction, let me promise you something, you're going to stay in the same direction. Oh, that's a fact. For you to do that, everybody stand up right now. This is going to be fun. Everybody up, up you get. Exercise for the day. All right, I want you to swap sides in the, in the church. Okay, swap sides. If you're on this side, you're on that side. If you're on that side, you're on that side. Leave your bags. No one's going to pinch anything. There you go. Everybody swap sides. Have you go. Have you seen somewhere else? Try to piece of Sorry, darling. Sorry. Should not have touched you. Sorry, Emma. Okay. Now you can all sit down for a minute. How many of you feel super duper comfortable? Okay. You're okay? How many actually had to get up and do something to get to the other side? Well, that's all of you. You actually had to do something. Do you know what you had to do? Talk. Talk. <laughs> you actually had to get up and change something to get to the other side. Now, if you had said, buggy, yeah, I'm not moving, I couldn't be bothered. What a stupid thing to ask us to do, Red. You would have stayed exactly where you were and you wouldn't be in a different place. This is what it means by God and sin on earth. I don't believe it's a punishment from God. I don't believe it's a threat from God. I believe that what he's saying is I love you so much to leave you. I've taken you broken and I'll take all your brokenness right now 
but I love you too much to leave you in it. Because if I leave you exactly where you are, you're going to stay where you are. None of us volunteer to have to fix things in our life, do they? Who volunteers for that? Pick me, Lord. Let's have a fun session on me. Let's interrogate my life. Anybody put their hand up for that? I tried during the week and that was my silliest thing I ever did. Because he started bringing up topics that I don't want to talk to him about. No, don't want to talk about that. He said, well, we really need to. We go, no, we don't. And he's saying, yeah, we do. Because there's still a bondage in your life. When he said, I've come to set you free, what do you think he meant? Do you think he meant just so you can cope? Do you think he meant just so you can survive? Just so you can live? Or do you think he meant he's come to give you life and life abundantly? Which one do you think? How many of you want the life and life abundantly? All the joys of him, the peace, the, the joy, the patience, the happiness, you know, being content with who you are. How many of you, if you look in the mirror, are actually pretty happy with who you are and go, you know what, I'm pretty cool as I am. How many say that? Why can't you? Jesus says that about you. Why can't you look in the mirror and go, you know what, I'm doing all right as I am? Because he says you are. That doesn't mean there's not things you want to change. I'm not saying that. I'm saying let him do the change. But when he changes that, he's going to start challenging you. Challenging you to change the way you think, the way you look, the way you hear, and the way you receive. You know, I know people in this room that if I say, Jesus says you're the most beautiful person on the earth, you'll go, yeah, 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 but inside you're going, huh? Inside you're struggling. Not used to hearing it. How many of you hear from God all the time just how precious you are? Because you should be. I've heard people say to me, but I can't hear from God, Red, and I'm going, no, you got this man the wrong way. You're still hearing everything else but him. You're blocking out when he's trying to say how precious you are. You're going, no, no. He's trying to say it. Because my Bible teaches me that he talks, that he wants to communicate with every person on earth. He wants to talk to all of us. Not one excluded. But when he tries to talk and he says, you're valuable, you go, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. My family told me that I'm worth nothing. And he's trying to say, I don't care what they said. I'm trying to tell you you're worth everything. I love this now because I've always seen go and sit no more in black and white until now. Now I've realized what he means by turn, walk away from where you are. It's not a threat of eternal hell. All right? Although there is sin that leads to death. And you know what? You can still choose. If you want to be like that woman who had hepatitis C and go back because he's healed you, now go back to where you are. Guess what's going to happen to you? I promise you nothing's going to change. It'll get worse before it gets better. Simple as that. And it might even end up costing you your life. It might cost you your marriage. It might cost you your friends. It might cost you your health. It's going to cost you a lot. But if you stop and you turn, Oh, it's still going to cost you. You live in a fallen world. But imagine having him set you free. You know, I can stand in front of all of you and as much as people are sitting in judgment on my lack of education in biblical school, my lack of um, fashion, <laughs> my lack of beauty, <laughs> all right? my lack of intelligence, my lack of articulation, I can't talk, I sit with Andrew, oh you're over this side now, that's right. <laughs> I, sit I sit with Andrew and I listen to him talk and right, the, articulate, the articulation he has with the Bible is amazing. I listen to Annette when she's talking about the administration side of the church and I sit there going, my God. I watch Sally get up at our board meetings and she talks about the finances and I'm sitting there going, that's over my head. To give me a calculator, Sally, just tell me the end result. I go talk to Kubis and when I go to see him for medical things and he talks to me, I'm sitting going, my God. Yeah, you know what Jesus said to me when I go, but Lord, have a look at all of this. Look what you've done. So much more than you've ever done for me. I can't talk. I can't do. I can't. You know what he said to me? He said, I want you to look at them. I want you to look at me. And I said to him, what do you mean? And he goes, because I've got one thing inside of you that others don't have. And I said to him, what's that? And he said, you know, I love you. That's all I got is I know that Jesus loves me as I am. I don't need to be anything I'm not. I don't have to try and be like the international speakers. 
I don't have to get up here and try to look the best with a three, four thousand dollar suit. I don't have to do none of that. All I have to do is get up here and say, you know what? My Saviour loves me and between the two of us, one day I'll actually get there. But between now, man, I'm a work in progress. And I'm not perfect. I'm still flawed. I've still got some problems. And it sucks because if I don't say it out loud, and that's sitting up the back looking at me going, yeah, I don't know all about you. So I can't lie, even if I want it. Even if I want to tell a few porkies, my wife's up the back going, I don't know. I was talking to a lady to 1.30 on the phone this morning, 17-year-old who's suddenly saying to me, I'm not cutting no more. And I said to her, so what do you think's changed? And she said, I know who I am in God. And I said, who are you? She said, I'm just a daughter. She didn't put nothing else to it. She said, I'm just a daughter. And I went, how blessed are you to discover that at 17? It took me to 32 to work out who God was. And she goes, you reckon God could use my life? And I went, use you. You can do more than all of us. Can I tell you how blessed you are? That he handpicked you. Don't think you chose him. He did. He chose you. All you did was respond to him because he knew what your thoughts were, how bad your life was, how you were hurting, whatever it may be. He knew. What do you reckon he knows about you today? I'm going to finish with this. What do you reckon he knows about you today? Everything. He knows your weaknesses, your flaws. He knows your strengths. He knows if you love him or not. You know that Father Christmas thing, he knows if you're naughty or nice. <laughs> Can I tell you, if he knows everything and he still says I'm not ashamed of you and he still says I'll take you as you are, why are we throwing stones at ourselves? Why can we not see ourselves? Who cares what we've stuffed up with? Man, if we go around the room and start telling the truth, I reckon some people are here, your toes will curl. Because there's some serious stuff that people have been through in here and done in here, just amongst us. You know, close your eyes for a second. Now, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, yeah? I'm not going to speak, which is almost impossible. But anyway, I'm going to shut up for 30 seconds. I want you to search your own heart. Don't look at me. Still struggling with worthy things? You're still struggling with your identity? You're still thinking that you're a fraud? Still thinking that you're a failure? Having trouble letting go of some of these habits because you haven't dealt with what's wrong in your heart? Well, take the time. You know what the Bible's taught me? All he said to her, Jesus, to this woman about to be stoned, he said, where are your accusers now? So I'm going to ask you right now, where are your accusers? She said, there's none, Lord. And he said, that neither do I condemn you. So right now I'm going to say to every one of you, right now, he does not condemn you. And then he said, woman, go and sit no more. Hand over what you need to hand over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll give you this. I just, the Lord said, uh, this stuff on my heart, like this was on the last week. And, mm -hmm. and um, so he says in Colossians 1, verse 20, um, through the Son, God also reconciled all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, whether making by making peace through the blood of his cross. You who were once alienated with a hostile attitude, doing evil, he has now reconciled by the death of his physical body, so that he might present you holy, blameless, and without fault before him. Okay, so you're holy, blameless, and without fault before him. Therefore you must remain firmly established and steadfast in the faith without being moved from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So that's the gospel. He sees you as holy, blameless, and without fault, and you just have to stick with that. So if the condemning voice comes against you to say you're not that, you're not good enough, turn and look and, and, and hold on to what, how he sees you, which is holy, holy. I mean, holy is absolutely perfect. It's not disloyalty and doing a few good things sometimes. It's you know, perfect, blameless, and without fault. That's it. That's all we must do. Amen. Just with the eyes closed, keep searching out for a minute. That just prompted me with something. I remember when I was talking to him during the week, he said to me, I've got one mold, one body, low case, and he owns it. One mold, 
one body, no case, and he owns it. Hold it. Precious in his sight. So I'm going to let you sit. Yeah, I'm just going to take this off for a sec. So you sit there, just search your house. Here you go. Something you've got to deal with.